Okay, I have here an email from a listener. Uh, they wrote and they asked a couple questions. They wanted their name to remain anonymous, so I'll respect that. It says here, uh, Hi, just want to say I am really enjoying your sermons. Thank you for them. Uh, I have some ideas that I would like to hear spoken on and weighed against Scripture if you are interested. And, of course, I am. Uh, and then and then this listener uh, lists three different topics that they would like to have me address. Uh, the first is Christians and insurance. Second is biblical separation. And the third is Christians and TV. So I'm going to cover each one of these in uh, detail here in this study. Okay, the first one that's mentioned there is Christians and insurance. And I'll read the email here. It says, uh, is having car, home, health, or life insurance unbiblical? Maybe you have already mentioned this in another sermon. And I haven't. That's a very good question. And I never have covered this in any of the sermons. At least not that I'm aware of. So we're going to look here at what the Bible says uh, for and against this idea of insurance. Okay, uh, and of course, insurance is pretty much a recent thing. I seriously doubt that they had anything like it back there in the first century. At least I've never heard of it. But uh, there are the concepts of the thing of man-made protection versus God protecting you. It It is there in Scripture. So we're going to look here at first in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. And we're going to see some Scriptures that could be used to argue against the idea of insurance. It says here, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Let me just stop there for a minute. <clears throat> The Bible teaches that you should have a fear of God. Okay, the lost definitely need to fear the Lord. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Um, but even the saved should have a fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, the fear of God is something that you understand. I shouldn't be worried about the, the lost world, the wicked world out there, because God can protect me from them. Okay, God can protect you. Let's continue reading here. Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. That's pretty interesting right there. God is not up there completely ignorant of you and he doesn't know what's going on with you and he just kind of ignores you no that's not it and especially if you're saved i mean the lost the bible says the eyes of the lord are um in every place beholding the evil and the good you know so god is seeing even the, what the lost are doing but especially for his children for those who are saved he has the hairs on your head numbered that's how well he knows you that's how well he watches over you Okay, and, and of course, if he is, if God knows about sparrows and that a sparrow isn't going to be sold or fall to the ground and God doesn't know about it, you're of more value than a sparrow to God. So God can watch over you. He can keep you safe. That definitely is there in scripture. You can see that there. Now we're going to jump down to Luke chapter 12, verse 22 and read down a couple verses here. And of course, this is Jesus speaking here in Luke chapter 12. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? A cubit, most uh, measurements are about 18 inches. Now, you can't add 18 inches to your height. Uh, that's not possible. Uh, verse 26, If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? 
Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Now notice the last statement there in, in Luke chapter 12, verse 30. Uh, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Now why did Jesus say that? Well, because at that point in time, he was dealing with only one nation, and that nation was Israel. Okay, and, and another statement that's made here, the, the same retelling of the story, is Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32, where Jesus says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Okay, now these words were written to Jews who were still doctrinally in the Old Testament. You can listen to some of our studies on non-dispensational Christian contradictions. Uh, you need to study the dispensations in the Bible. It is very obvious that there are at least two dispensations. Any Christian would admit to that. They had different things back there in the Old Testament. They were sacrificing animals. They had the Levitical priesthood. They had the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies and all that. We don't have those today as Christians. Okay, when you sin, you don't have to go sacrifice an animal. Obviously, something changed. But you can see, if you read through the Gospels, you can see that they still had the Old Testament set up. You know, the man that was cleansed of leprosy that came to Jesus, Jesus said, Go and show thyself to the priest and offer the sacrifice commanded by Moses. So be very careful when you read the word of God that you make sure that you rightly divide it. And here in these passages, you have Jesus speaking specifically to the Jews. Okay, he's not dealing with the Gentiles as a people yet. Now, in the book of Acts, you see the transition where they're going to the synagogue at first and they're speaking just to the Jews, and then the gospel starts being taken to the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul, when he comes along, he specifically later on calls himself the Apostle to the Gentiles. So now, you know, the, the gospel has been sent to us. And But if you notice there in these two passages, in Luke chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 6, the Lord is saying, don't worry about what you are to eat. Don't worry about what you, you know, uh, put on your clothing and things for after these things do the Gentiles seek. And then later, as the gospel comes to the Gentiles, you say, well, did everything stay the same there that what Jesus was saying? Well, Jesus, when he came, what came as the king of the Jews, he came as their promised Messiah and they rejected him. And what Jesus was offering when he was here the first time, when he came, he offered the kingdom. That's why he's preaching the kingdom of the heaven, or the kingdom of heaven. He was offering the physical kingdom to them, and they rejected him as their Messiah. So a lot of what's going on here is doctrinally for that millennial reign. And when you start to take those scriptures and apply them to you today, and you start saying, I don't have to work. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat. You know, the Lord's going to provide it. Well, the Lord can provide that, but he does expect you to work. Okay, and we're going to see that. Uh, when the church age came in and the gospel started to be taken to the Gentiles, uh, what happened at that point? Um, here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work... Neither should he eat, or neither should he eat, whichever way, way you want to say that. The point is, you're supposed to work. You know, I, if I said right now, hey, I'd like to have a, a glass of water, I'm going to pray for a glass of water, and I'm just going to sit here till the Lord brings it. Well, could the Lord do that? Well, yeah, he could. I mean, he's, his power, he could, you know, make anything happen. But the fact of the matter is, 
the Lord expects me to get up and walk in and go to the kitchen sink and get some water, you know, out of the, out of the faucet there. If I need water, I need to go get it myself. Okay, the Lord gives us common sense too. Okay, and the Bible says plainly there in 2 Thessalonians 3.10 that if you're not working, you shouldn't eat. Implying that you need to work for a living. Especially if you're a man. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay, a saved man has the responsibility to provide for his wife and children as well as his extended family. And you'll see that there in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It talks about the cares or the care of widows. You'll see that thing there. So you can't take verses that were doctrinally written to the Jews, to the nation of Israel, that you know Jesus was there offering the kingdom of heaven. You can't take those and apply them totally to the, to the church age and ignore the other exhortations in Scripture written to us Gentile Christians that say you need to work. Okay? You say, well, how does this relate to insurance? Well, we're going to see about that. Okay, first of all, we're going to look at car insurance. That's the first one that's listed there. Car insurance. Well, should a Christian have car insurance? Well, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but I know here in America, if you don't have car insurance, you're not going to be driving. Okay, in fact, you're not even going to be able to buy a car. If you go to a used car dealership or a new car dealership or buy one privately, you have to have the title transferred over in, into your name. You have to have get the car registered in your name. And um, when you go to do that, they're going to ask you for proof of insurance. You're not going to be able to buy the car unless you have proof of insurance. And a lot of times they'll even call your insurance company right there or a insurance company right there and get you an insurance policy. Uh, that's the way the laws are here, at least in Pennsylvania. I don't know other states here in America. I'm not sure how that is. And in Australia, UK, Canada, I don't know about that. And even you know some of the other countries there in Europe or, or wherever. I'm not sure how it works there, but I know here... If you don't have insurance, you aren't going to be driving unless you decide to do it illegally. And then you have the problem of now you have a bad Christian testimony because you're doing something illegal and you're putting your faith in constitutional law and, uh, you know, all this other stuff. You start getting into that and you end up spending all your time trying to get around the law system here and study laws and, and, you start to forsake the things of the Lord. And I've seen that. A lot of these guys that get into the patriot movement and they they start, you know, trying to get around this and get around that, they get absolutely nothing done for the Lord. Okay, you have to weigh that stuff out. Is it really worth it, in other words? And part of the concept of car insurance also is the fact that even if you're a really good driver and you're doing good, and you get hit by somebody and they do a hit and run and they get out of there and you, you can't get their license plate number or whatever, you know, your insurance is there to cover that. So your insurance is not only to cover up your own mistakes, but also something that you might be completely innocent of and somebody hits you and they take off. And that's happening a lot, uh, in this country. So car insurance, should you have it as a Christian? I would say that one, yes. Because if you don't, it's going to affect your testimony. And it's also, you're not going to be able to drive unless you do it illegally. And that's a problem. Uh, can God protect you? Could God protect you and, you know, somehow get you the money to fix your vehicle if you wreck it or whatever? Yeah, but, you know, again, you're going to have a hard time explaining to the police if you get pulled over or whatever because you don't have an inspection sticker and you aren't going to be able to get your vehicle inspected without insurance i mean it's it just creates a, a big mess the thing of car insurance i would say car insurance yeah a christian should have car insurance uh, in a perfect world you know it'd be nice not to have car insurance it would be nice to have a, a good government and everything but yeah right 
Uh, secondly, what about homeowner's insurance? Okay, now this this is where we start getting into the debatable. Okay, um, why? Well, because your house's safety is really your responsibility. If you keep your house clean and you keep it nice and and everything, you don't live in a dangerous area like a floodplain or some place like that, and you make sure that all your wiring is hooked up correctly and everything there is good. You're not going to have a fire from a short circuit or whatever. You know, eh, you could make the, the argument that maybe you don't need insurance for your home. Okay? And you say, what about natural disasters? You know, what about some hurricane or what about this or what about, you know, a tornado or forest fire, or flood, whatever? Well, who controls the nature? You know, who controls the weather? Well, the Lord does. So you could rely on the Lord. And I mean, I do it here. Uh, whenever there's a major storm that comes through, I pray. And I just say, Lord, please protect the house and the other buildings outside. Uh, please just keep us safe through the storm. Um, and I trust in, in the Lord and, and he's always spared us. But uh, the question is, if you would lose your home to a fire or some other thing that's beyond your control, could you still provide for your family? Okay, remember 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says that you are to provide for your own. And if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. Could you still provide for your family if you lost everything and you had no insurance policy to rebuild your home? Well, I remember back when I was a young boy, we actually we didn't lose our home, but we had a pretty bad fire and we couldn't live in our house for a while until everything was fixed up again. And uh, we lived with different families and, and lived different places in the months that it took to rebuild our home. And we did all right. You know, we did okay. And, uh, you know, my father had insurance on the house. But if we didn't, if we had not had insurance, well, it would have been a major loss. And we would have had to start over again. It would have been very tragic, but... Could he have provided for us? Yeah. You know, the the, the Lord would have provided. Yeah. Um, and another point I want to make here is that, again, we have a system of corruption. I know here, especially in America, there's a lot of these insurance things, and, and I'm going to be talking about the medical establishment coming up here. But a lot of it, it's very corrupt, and you're kind of forced to be part of the, of the system. And it's kind of tragic in a way there. And I think in the past, not think in the past, in the past, uh, a lot of times the churches were there to help people. You'd have a family that would lose everything and, um, you know, the, the church would step in and, and help them out. I remember hearing the story about the man who wrote uh, the, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, that he lost his son and then he lived in Chicago, and there was the Great Chicago Fire, and he lost his home, he lost his business, lost everything. And D.L. Moody was over in England or Scotland, I think one of those two, and he called for him, and he said, bring your wife and, and your three daughters over. On the way over, the, the husband couldn't go right away. He had some other business things to tie up. And um, on the way over, the ship went down, and... The wife survived, but the three little daughters perished. They died. And then this man, I can't, I can never think of his name, but he, uh, went over then to be with his wife over there in England. And right when he was passing over the area where the ship went down is when he penned the song, It Is Well With My Soul. It's a very touching story. I mean, look into that. It's, it's a, just an amazing story. You know, the old hymns a lot of times were written by Christians that were going through a, a major trial or things like that. They weren't writing to get famous and, and to, you know, put out a CD that would make them millions of dollars like these phony professing Christians do today. But that's another subject. The point is, though, that a Christian helped another brother. And that's really the way it should be, you know. And if Christians weren't spending all their money on these giant church buildings and church properties, they would have plenty of money there 
to help Christians that have lost everything. So the Christians wouldn't need insurance. But again, the system is corrupt today. So what should you do as a homeowner? Well, you have to weigh that stuff out. Another thing that you have to weigh out is what is the cost of homeowner's insurance? Does it prohibit you from giving to the work of the Lord? Or will it strap you so tight financially that you won't be able to give to the Lord and to his work? That's something else you need to think about. Okay, what about health insurance? Can you live without health insurance? Uh, yeah. And you say, well, give me an example. Okay, myself. It's been 14 years now since I've had health insurance. Okay, can you live without health insurance? Yeah, absolutely. And they're trying to make it a mandatory thing now, and I know in some countries it is a mandatory thing that you have to have health insurance. But that's really kind of you know, crossing the line about where a government should be meddling, okay? My body is God's property, okay? My body belongs to the Lord. And for a government to get, to get in there and start commanding me what I should be doing with my body, no, that's overstepping their bounds. They don't have a right to do that, okay? That's a bad thing there. But here's the point. You say, well, wow, you've lived for 14 years without health insurance? Yeah, but I'm single. I have no children to take care of. I have no wife to think about or, or children or anything. So for me, it's not really that big of a deal. Now, would it be a big deal if I had a wife and children? Yeah, yeah it might be. See, I'd have them to provide for. Right now, I provide for myself, which really doesn't take that much. So again, that can change things there. Um, but there are some things that you need to consider when it comes to having or not having health insurance. And again, here we go with the corruption thing. The corrupt health insurance medical establishment can ruin you financially for life if you need a major surgery. Uh, there are people that have had that happen. And, you know, and interestingly... I know of people that have had huge bills put on them even though they had insurance. So health insurance is not a guarantee that you'll be taken care of, all your bills will be taken care of. If you get some kind of a major, major illness or major thing where you have to have surgery after surgery and you're in the hospital for a year or so and it racks up all kinds of bills... A lot of health insurance companies will, up to a certain point, they'll pay for it, and then, and then after that, they'll say, sorry, we're not paying anymore. So health insurance is not a guarantee that all your medical bills will be paid for. I do know of cases here locally where people had major problems in their family with a child or a wife or a husband or whatever, and the health insurance stopped covering them. So it's not a guarantee that everything's going to be paid for. But if you don't have health insurance, there's another concept that you need to think about. Because I have no health insurance, it forces me to live healthy. A lot of people that have health insurance, they don't really think much about their health because if something goes wrong, well, the doctor will fix it. The hospital will fix me up. See, no, nah, it's, it's a problem. You know, one of the things that I live... Uh, one of my big philosophies in life is the uh, concept of prevention. I don't really look so much for cures. I look for prevention. In other words, you know, I don't ever want to get so sick from a cold that it turns into the flu or pneumonia or something and I have to go to the hospital. So what do I do? Do I try and find the cure for the flu or something? No. I try to eat healthy and live healthy and dress appropriately when I go places when it's cool and whatever. I try to prevent the sickness in the first place. And which is kind of a good way to live as a Christian. You know, you should live with that same mindset with sin. You should live and try to prevent yourself from sinning. Not try to look for cures of, now I sin, now the Lord's punishing me, what do I do now? You know, somebody comes along and they say, I have cancer. Oh, really? Why is that? Well, I smoked for 40 years. What do I do now? Well, you shouldn't have started smoking in the first place. Okay, that's prevention. <laughs> you know, don't look for a cure to something that you shouldn't have been doing.
Okay, so it forces you to live healthy when you have no insurance, which is another good argument for not having health insurance. Uh, and again, I'll say this one more time. The, I can't really give a firm answer from the Bible. And we're going to see here in a, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to read a scripture for you on that issue. But I can't give a really firm answer. This is the way it's supposed to be because it's going to depend on whether or not you're married. Okay. If, if I was married and I had a wife and we decided, Hey, let's have some children. That would get very, very expensive to have children without any kind of insurance. Something you have to weigh out is the, will the insurance become something that becomes too great of a debt and it, it forces you to live penny to penny because of this insurance? Or do you have enough money that if it's covered, it's no problem? Those are things you're going to have to weigh out. Now, finally, the fourth uh, type of insurance would be life insurance. And the question there would be, who will be benefiting from it? Okay. Um, is it someone who needs the money? You know, there again, I talked to a brother recently and he said he had this huge life insurance policy for his wife and kids. And he said he got to thinking about it and he was kind of like, you know, it would almost be like if I died, it'd be like she won the lottery. <laughs> you know, she'd have all kinds of money. And he said, you know, that's not really scriptural. I mean, people within the church would take care of her and, and the kids and and they would help her out. And she really doesn't need, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So he's, you know, kind of revising that idea there. So that's another thing that you need to think about. Now, the scripture here that could be used to apply to any of this insurance stuff uh, for the Christian is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Okay, the first line there. All things are lawful unto me. Okay, as a Christian, when you get saved, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. It's in the book of Ephesians there. You have eternal security. Okay, all things are lawful at that point unto you, but all things are not expedient. Okay, in other words, all things are not good for you. Okay, you have to weigh that stuff out. Can you have insurance? Is it okay for you to have insurance as a Christian? Yes. Should you rely totally on the Lord to take care of all your problems? Yes and no. Okay, can the Lord take care of your problems? Yeah. But the Lord is not going to do everything for you either. That doesn't lead to, you know, the Lord doesn't want welfare Christians. You know, he wants Christians that are going to work, that are going to put in some time, that are going to, you know, work hard. Okay? The Lord expects you to do some things. So, can the Lord protect you and, and you don't need insurance? Yeah. I mean, if you don't make much money, uh, that's mainly the reason why I don't have health insurance is because I just don't have the money for it. You know, it would be ridiculous to spend, I mean, I looked into it and it would be a couple hundred dollars a month and it's just not going to happen. And even if I get it for cheaper at this point in time, you know, I don't trust a medical establishment. I stay away from doctors and hospitals. <laughs> Only with emergencies do I go in there. And, and I had two emergencies and I went in and it cost me a couple hundred dollars each time. But you go in and you say, hey, I have no health insurance, you know, whatever types of things you have that I can sign up for or something to, to lessen the cost here, you know, please let's do that. And so uh, the point is, do you have to have insurance? Well, you're going to have to answer that question for yourself. I can't answer that. Uh, it is lawful unto you, but is it expedient? That's the whole thing there. And it says there in the second part of 1 Corinthians 6.12, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Okay? Is these different types of insurance, will they put you into debt? The Bible says you're to owe no man anything. So be careful about that. If you can pay it and you have a family that you have to take care of, and a wife and kids or whatever, well, you probably should. 
Uh, if you're single and don't really need it, well, then you probably don't need it. But that's that's something that you're just going to have to pray about. It's not a sin to have insurance. Okay, I'll answer it that way. Now, on to the second question. What about biblical separation? I'll read the email here. It says, uh, in particular, how do you deal with the issue of biblical separation from friends who are professing Christians who attend church, but whom, as far as you can tell, are unsaved, without completely offending and alienating them? Is total separation required, as in no contact, or is the separation only meant to extend to withdrawing from spiritual fellowship? I have a friend whose intentions are good most of the time, I believe, but who I am starting to wonder is really saved at all. He is deeply involved in his quote-unquote church, a part of the staff, and I am finding lately that whenever I meet with him, I come away feeling angry and spiritually contaminated. <laughs> Amen, I, I can attest to that myself. I know people like that. Uh, because of the lack of actually following scripture at his church. He is a kind person and a good friend, but I cannot correlate between his professing to be a follower of Christ and not yet being so involved in a church system that chops and changes the rules according to its pleasures and whim. How does biblical separation work and what does it cost? There's a good question. And more importantly, what do you do when you have, or when you find you have no other bot believers left to fellowship with if you have left a church business system and have no other biblical or home fellowships nearby, not even far by. Again, you may have uh, already preached on this. And I have, but uh, this is a good question, and so I'm going to cover it here in, in detail. Now, in the Bible, there are two different types of separation, okay? Because there are two different types of people. You have people that are lost and people that are saved, so first of all, I want to cover here separation from the lost. Okay, we're going to start here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. It says here, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let me just stop there for a minute. The lost world has a tendency to say, you know, what? are you better than me? You think you're better than me? And the Christian answer should be yes. You say, oh, really? That sounds kind of arrogant. Well, think about something. Verse 16 there in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says that your body is the temple of the living God. Think about that. Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, has his Holy Spirit living within your body. Does that make you better than a lost man or woman on their way to hell? Yes. By definition, yes, it does. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Theirs isn't. Our Father, as Christians, is Almighty God. Their Father, as lost people, is Satan, the Father of lies. Are we better than they are? Yes. Now, are we more of our own selves? Are we better? No. I'm a saved sinner. Okay, they're a lost sinner. I'm a saved sinner. I still sin. I still have temptations. So do you, if you're a Christian. Uh, you know, there's a the Nazarenes, I think, out there, the Nazarene denomination they teach that your old man is eradicated and that you don't sin anymore after you get saved which is preposterous uh, i guess you do read romans chapter 7 paul still was tempted to sin after being saved okay and there's not a nazarene on that ever lived that was even close to paul as far as good works and and being a good christian yes you will still sin but so you're not better in and of yourself but you are better in the fact that God is in you. Okay? So then why should you compromise yourself and compromise your beliefs to be around the lost world? That's something that you need to think about. Okay? You are to have a higher standard. You are to be holier than they are. You're not to bring yourself down to that sinful level. Okay? You are to practice separation from them. 
And you're to be there to convict them of their sins too, by the way, which we'll get into in just a little bit here. But continuing on, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Okay? Now, if you go up through the verses there again, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 down uh, through 16, it says, What fellowship... What communion, what concord, what part, what agreement? See, and look at all those different things. Can you really fellowship with the lost world? Can you be in communion with them? Can you be in concord with them? Do you have a part with them? Can you be in agreement with them? Now, that doesn't mean that you have to totally... Alienate yourself from anybody that's lost. You can't shop where the lost are. You can't work where the lost are. You can't, you know, you wouldn't be able to do anything in this life. It's not talking about that. It's talking about fellowship. Coming together and being around them, becoming friends with them. Sooner or later, it's going to come up. They're going to try to tell you a dirty joke or they're going to offer you a beer or a cigarette or whatever. Or they're going to say something that's contra contrary to the scriptures. You can't be in agreement with them. And the Bible says there in verse 17 that you are to come out from among them and be ye separate. So does the Bible teach separation from the lost world? Absolutely. Yeah. And you are not to let them tear you down to their standards, down to their level as sinners, as lost sinners. You are to live holier than they are. And they'll say, oh, you're holier than thou. Yes. <laughs> I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to have higher standards than the lost world. And it's rather sad, by the way, there are many situations, many times, when lost people will actually have higher standards than professing Christians. I've seen that, too. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You are to be a conviction to the lost world. There, You are to convict them of their sins. Okay, the Bible talks about that we are the salt. What does salt do? It irritates. <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to be as Christians. And, and you know, the modern Christian comes along and they say, yeah, but didn't Jesus hang out with the lost? You know, I remember hearing a thing from Michael W. Smith the one time, and he said that if Jesus were here today, he'd be hanging out at the bars. You know, kind of like he'd be there, you know, kind of cool with the way people are living. No, that's not at all what the Bible teaches. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 30 through 35. Here's the story about this thing of Jesus being a friend of the publicans and sinners. And and notice in this story as I read it here, uh, who said, who made the statement that Jesus is their friend. Luke chapter 7, verse 30 says, But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. Now verse 33 and 34 here is very typical of how the lost world will treat you. It says here, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Okay, but wisdom is justified of all her children. Here, verse 35. But notice, John the Baptist didn't eat bread and he didn't drink wine. And they said, well, he has a devil. He's possessed. Jesus came doing those two things, eating bread and drinking wine. And they said, oh, look at him. He's gluttonous and a wine beber. <laughs> so you can't please everybody. Okay, as a Christian, the only one that you really have to worry about pleasing is the Lord. Don't worry about trying to please the world and fit in with the world. It isn't going to happen. Okay, you do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, and you're going to get the lost world making fun of you. And don't say, oh man, I better conform to them and try to please them. No. And there in verse 34, it said, Jesus said that uh, these Pharisees were saying of him that he is a friend of publicans and sinners. Okay, he's saying that they say that about me. Jesus Christ did not say, I am a friend of publicans and sinners. Okay, you say, well, then Jesus wasn't their friend? 
Yeah, he was their friend. He was the friend of publicans and sinners, but not from the standpoint of having tolerance for their sin, which is what the modern professing church is trying to pull across. Why? Well, because most of them are lost, and they don't like their sins judged any more than a lost, hell-bound sinner walking down the street. They don't want to have want to be told, hey, that's wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong, that's a sin, that's going to land you in hell. They don't like doing that. They don't like hearing that. So they try to make Jesus into a sinner. And they try to say, oh, you know, he was a friend. He'd hang out at the bars if he was here. No, he wouldn't. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. We're going to read down through here a couple verses, and we're going to see why Jesus was with the publicans and sinners. Luke chapter 5, verse 27 and 28 says, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. You know, that's a good picture of salvation, specifically of true repentance, true salvation. Jesus says to the lost, Hey, you, follow me. And so most of the lost will say, well, you know, what are my friends going to think? I, I got a good job. I don't know if I'm ready. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if today's, you know, the right day for it. I don't have the right feeling. But then you get those lost people. Jesus says, hey, you, follow me. And they leave all, get up and follow him. Good picture of salvation. But let's continue on here. Luke chapter 5, verses 29 through 32. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, they wouldn't go to Jesus, they went to his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. People say, these easy believism apostates say that uh, repentance, you don't have to repent of your sin. What does that mean right there? Came to call sinners to repentance. Watch out for that easy believism stuff where all you do is just pray a magic prayer and you get in without any kind of conviction of sin. That is not the true gospel. Okay, It's a false gospel. But Jesus there said that these people were sick. And that they needed to repent. That's why he was with the lost. He wasn't there showing tolerance for their sins. Okay? It's just really sickening to hear these modern Christians trying to twist the biblical Jesus. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, Jesus Christ was tempted in all points like as we are. It's kind of interesting because part of his upbringing was in Egypt. You can read about that in the Bible. They went to Egypt for a little while. Now, don't you know that there are probably some real temptations there in Egypt? Very wicked place to be raised. You know, it'd be kind of like going to Las Vegas or something today, you know, as a Christian and being raised there. It'd be a bad place. And Jesus was tempted, but yet without sin. And by the way, it's not a sin to be tempted. It only becomes a sin when you give in to the temptation. Keep that in mind. But the point is, Jesus Christ, yes, he, he was with publicans and sinners, but he wasn't there tolerating their sin and, and, and indulging in those sins. No, he was without sin. So watch out for this modern church philosophy that Jesus would hang out with sinners and he'd go down to the bar and hang out, you know, and, and become their friend and stuff. No, no. Jesus went to where the sinners were and he commanded them to repent and said, hey, you, follow me. You need to forsake all and follow me. That's what was going on there. Now, that's separation from the lost world. 
You should be separate from the lost world. You should not hang out with lost people. Okay? But what about separation from heretical professing Christians? Titus chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and admoni second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Okay, God will take care of a Christian that's messed up doctrinally. Okay, and, and refuses to be corrected. I should say that, you know, there are Christians that are messed up doctrinally because they're ignorant. And you can tell them the truth and they'll change. And praise God for those. But then you have some that are messed up doctrinally and they won't hear anything different. And God will take care of them. Uh, but what if they continue in their false doctrines and it doesn't seem like God does anything about it? Well, what's going on there? Well, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7 talks about that. It says here, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Hmm. Verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers... You're saved. You're going to get some chastisement occasionally. Then are ye bastards and not sons. A bastard is a Bible word there for a son or daughter that has no father. Okay? If you have no real father, if he's not in your life, then you're not saved. You need to have God the Father in your life. And a lot of these people that you see, these modern professing Christians that are so messed up doctrinally and they will not be corrected and they just go on and on and they just keep getting worse and worse and nothing happens to them. They just go on prospering and everything else. They're prospering because their father, who is Satan, the god of this world currently, lowercase g, god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, he's blessing them. And that's what you see a lot among a lot of these modern professing Christians. They're being blessed because they're following their true father, Satan. And if they were truly saved, they would be corrected. They would be chastised by the Lord. But because there's no correction there from God, they're not sons. Just the way it is. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Notice that they have good words and fair speeches. The email there talked about how that this guy that works in this modern church, he's a nice guy. He's kind. By the way, the word nice isn't in the King James Bible. Interesting little side note. But he's a kind guy, and you know he does lots of good things, and he he talks like he's good, and he talks like he's kind. I know a lot of people like that too. I know an awful lot of people like that. They're just the nicest person that you'd ever want to meet, until you start to talk to them about the King James Bible being God's true word, the new versions coming from the Vatican, until you start saying that the Catholic Church is Satan's church, it's the whore. You know, the Babylonian whore, Revelation 17 and 18, and all Catholics are going to hell. You know, until you start saying rock music of, is of Satan and it can't be Christianized, then their little nice veneer goes away very quickly. And you'll see that thing there. And by the way, it says that you are, you are to mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Mark men like uh, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, Billy Graham, a lot of these big false prophets. Mark them. And don't be afraid to slam them. They say, well, I don't want to name names. You better name names. You better warn people. I mean, if there's a product out there that's poisonous and it's making people sick, you don't say, well, um, product A. No. 
You say, hey, this product right here, there it is, there's a picture of it, that stuff's bad, it's poisonous, don't eat it. And how much more important it is to mark false prophets that are destroying people doctrinally. Something you need to think about. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ into the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. Oh, but he's educated. He has a PhD. He's proud, knowing nothing. If he doesn't consent to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means the words that are written. Look out for these people that say, oh, I, I just, I love Jesus. And what would Jesus do? And Jesus is just so loving and kind. And he's this and it. What's the Bible say? People need to be talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Okay. Read Matthew chapter 23 and see if that lines up with the modern day Jesus. Okay. Uh, that's another subject I could go off on. But uh, continuing here, verse 4. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Okay, strifes of words there, by the way, questions and strifes of words. It's not the same as saying, you know, I'm a King James Bible believer and I cut on the new versions. But see, I have a final authority. I'm saying the King James Bible is God's perfect word, the others are not. Here's where their words are messed up. But then I offer you a perfect replacement in the King James Bible. The new version people will attack the King James Bible, but then you say, is your new version perfect? No. See, they don't offer you any kind of a replacement. They'll go to Greek and Hebrew and they'll strive about words and meanings and things. What's the meaning of Pascha? Well, this manuscript here says that, and that manuscript and this text and this uh, scholar and, and this... See, they have no final authority. I'm a King James Bible believer. I turn people to the book. I don't turn people to myself. I say, hey, the King James Bible, this is God's word. This is what you need to read and believe. Okay? Not the same thing. I, you know, I know how the enemies work, and I know how people turn things on me and things. I've been attacked plenty. And so I thought, I'll just throw that out there to kind of eliminate the attack before it comes. <laughs> Uh, but First Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, continuing here, it says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Okay? Oh, well, I believe this brother is good because he's on TV and he's got a huge church. Supposing that gain is godliness. Yeah. That's another big thing, you know, they'll say, well, if the King James Bible is God's true word and the other ones are bad, then why is it that Chuck Swindle and, and Charles Stanley and Billy Graham and, and Rick Warren and all these other guys, why is it that they're, they're as big and popular as they are and yet they don't use the King James Bible, you know, exclusively? Well, because right there you're guilty of verse 5. You're supposing that gain is godliness. You think that the more popular a preacher is, the more he must know about the Bible and the more he must be serving the Lord. Not so. I think some of the finest preachers that are going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ are backwoods hillbillies that you never even heard of before. But they stayed true to, word, to the Word of God. They were strong men in their church. They didn't compromise. I think there's going to be a lot of men up there at the judgment seat that are going to get all the crowns and you're going to say, well, who's that guy? You know, the ones that are, you know, the Bible says what's highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. But continuing here, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You know, it talks about there in, uh, let me see if I can find it here quick. Titus chapter 1 verse 16, it says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Okay, they profess that they know God. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. 
That's why this listener that wrote and said that they talked to this friend and it's just like they profess that they know God. There's this form of godliness there. They go to church. They know the right things to say. But the power of the Holy Spirit, the, that, that spirit of truth that leads into all truth, it's just not there. And I know people that are like that. You hear these Christians, you know, well, I go to Christian, you know, I go to church and I'm a Christian and I, Jesus is my savior and everything. And you say, well, what do you think about this? And it's totally contrary to the Bible. And it's just like, is the Holy Spirit really in this person? You know, bad thing. Now you say, well, well, should I totally shun this person then? You know, I'm supposed to turn away. I'm supposed to get totally away from them. So then what do I do? Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. Remember Romans chapter 16, mark them, it said. Note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Should you depart from an apostate, professing Christian? Yes, you should have no company with them. But look at verse 15. Second Thessalonians 3.15 says, Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Okay? If this heretical professing believer is somebody that you can avoid, do it. Okay? There are a lot of people that I know of in my past that were heretical, that I went to church with or whatever, or that I associated with in the past. I avoid them. I don't want anything to do with them. They, you know, they write an email or something. Hey, how you doing? You know, we ought to get together sometime. Uh, don't say that. Yeah, yeah. You know, we should get together. That's a lie. Just say no. I, you know, I don't. I don't think I can do that. That's not going to work out. And just go away. You say, well, that's kind of rude. Yeah, but it's honest. Okay. Uh, if they're a close relative or a family member somebody that you can't really avoid, then try to admonish them. You know, I have that to deal with as, as well. I have family members that are not Bible believers. They're very messed up doctrinally. I try to admonish them. I pray that the Lord opens doors when I have to be around them. I pray, Lord, give me an opportunity to speak the truth to them. And many times the Lord will open that door. Okay, I admonish them. All right. And it's kind of interesting because of another really good point here is that the modern church system is becoming increasingly more evil, which makes Bible-believing Christians work much easier. <laughs> you know, the things that we said are going to happen are coming to place, or they're coming to pass, excuse me. And, you know, the evil, the great apostasy, even a lot of these carnal lukewarm type Christians, they're starting to get disturbed now and they're starting to say, wow, this is really getting bad. You know, my church did this thing last week and boy, that wasn't good at all. You know, and even the most ignorant Christian, God's Holy Spirit, if he is in them, he'll start revealing stuff to them and say, you know what, you need to get out of there. And so as a Bible believer, you can be there to help them, to admonish them. But should you hang out with them? No, you shouldn't. Now, the other question that was asked there about biblical separation is, what does true biblical separation cost? Very good question. Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, here you have Paul writing. He says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days, but other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now notice there in, uh, where was it, verse 18. Then after three years... You mean Paul was alone as a Christian, just him and the Lord, for three years? Yeah. That's a long time, isn't it? Three years. Question. Could you handle solitary confinement with just yourself and the Lord Jesus Christ for a period of a year or more? I did. And I know of many others that have too. 
you know, that's just their own family, just, you know, wife and kids or, or just a, another friend or something like that. And it's just, there's no church in their area that they can go to, you know, everything's apostate and they're just like, you know, what on earth am I supposed to do? I can't go anywhere. And they just spend that time getting to know the Lord better, listening to preaching, listening to the word of God. King James Bible, you know, being read to them, Alexander Scorby recordings or whoever. Uh, they read the King James Bible themselves. They get books. They read. They study. It's a time of intimacy between you and the Lord. Where the Lord can say, hey, forget all the other stuff out there. Forget all this church and conformity and everything. Spend some time with me. Get to know me better. But as Christians, we have this thing that Oh, I gotta be part of a fellowship. I have to be part of a church somewhere. You are part of the church. Okay, a church is not a building. It's not a corporation. It's a body of living believers. So you say, well, I'm not part of a church. Yes, you are, if you're saved. And the Lord might want you to, as part of your training as a Christian, He might want you to have to rely solely on Him for a while. Paul did it. You know, we had this weird idea that back in the first century, they had huge, big churches and just everybody was getting along and Paul was a pastor of a church with a thousand members in it or something. Read the Bible. That's not there. Okay. Paul, at one point, listed the men that were with him. And I think it was like five or six men. Another portion of scripture, he said, only Luke is with me. One other man? For the great Paul, the great apostle Paul? Yeah. And, you know, he went to prison and, and a lot of Christians were becoming ashamed of him because he was in jail. Yeah. As a Christian, there are going to be times when you are going to be downright lonely. When the Lord is going to say, hey, I'd like to spend some time with you alone. Just me and you. Well, Lord, but I'd like to have lots of friends. I'd like to have lots of fellowship. Well, maybe we'll get around to that. Maybe at some point in time you'll be ready for that. But right now I just want to spend some time with you alone. Maybe the Lord will have you go through that. Okay, that's what biblical separation is going to cost you. Uh, an interesting two verses here. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 and 2 says, Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermenteleth with all wisdom. Okay, when you desire to get to know the Lord better, when you desire, man, I want to know this Bible. I want to know about dispensationalism, about how to debate a Catholic, how to how to talk to a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon. Uh, I want to know about the occult. I want to know about the New World Order. I want to know about creation science. There are so many subjects that you can study as a Christian. But guess what? You're going to have to separate yourself. You're going to have to go through a little bit of solitary confinement to be able to do that. Okay? You'll have to separate yourself and seek an inner metal with all wisdom. You're going to have to do your own study. One of the worst things out there is this thing of a university or a seminary type of education because you are having to, to submit to the professor. And if the professor is wrong, well, then you're going to have to stand against him. And oftentimes people won't do that, especially the young, because there's the aspect of pre peer pressure. What are all the other students going to think if I stand up and rebuke this professor and tell him he's wrong? I might fail my test. I might get kicked off of campus here. So they keep their mouth shut and they just sit there and, and listen and obey whatever their professor tells them. And that's why we have such a problem today with these preachers that don't know the Bible. Because they were trained by professors that didn't know the Bible. It's bad. You'd be better off having a little bit of solitary confinement, just you and the Lord. Proverbs 18 verse 2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Okay, lover of pleasure more than lover of God. That's what a fool is into. They don't want to know the truth. Okay, the truth is never going to be popular, by the way. The Bible says that the road to hell is broad, and many there be which go in thereat. Okay, truth is a very small movement. And the more truth you know, the more truth you discover, you're going to realize that it's a very, very small movement. <laughs> you talk about a minority. King James Bible believing Christians are the greatest minority in the world. All right. Um, 
Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your body's a living sacrifice? Oh, doesn't sound too good. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now there's something that you need to remember here, which I kind of mentioned earlier. The larger the group of people that you are around, the larger the temptation will be to conform to them. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're saved, at some point in your life, as you mature spiritually, God is going to ask you to make some sacrifices. He's going to say, okay, uh, you've been saved now for a while, you've been praying, you've been reading your Bible. How about present your body a living sacrifice? And you say, okay, Lord, what does that uh, entail? What What is all in this thing of presenting yourself as a living sacrifice? Well, first of all, are you willing to sacrifice your goals and dreams? You know, if you'd have gone back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and asked me what I was going to be when, I'm, when I was 36, it would not be where I'm at today. Okay, I had my life planned. I had lots of goals and dreams, and they were not ministry. Okay, I had my own selfish interests in mind. And the Lord, at some point in time, years ago, he said, are you going to sacrifice your goals and dreams for me? And I said, yeah, I'll do that. And I have. You know, and God's going to take you to that point too. Will you sacrifice your goals and dreams? Secondly, will you sacrifice money? Would you be willing to sacrifice having lots of money and, and have some struggles with money? The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. Something for you to think about. How about your friends? Would you sacrifice your friends for the Lord? To serve the Lord? Would you be willing to have your friends turn against you and call you crazy and say, oh, they really got messed up. They got into that Bible stuff and they really you know, went off the deep end. I don't even like being around them anymore. Would you be willing to see your friends disassociate from you? How about your family? The Bible says about how that Jesus said that uh, if a man come to me and hate not his father and mother and you know brother and sister and all that, that he's not worthy of me. He's not worthy to be my disciple. It doesn't mean that you have to hate him like you want to kill him or something. No, it just means that your love for the Lord is greater than your love for the fa your family. Would you be willing to have your family turn against you? Would you sacrifice your family? Hmm. How about your reputation? That's another big one. Would you be willing to be a fool for Christ? And that doesn't mean you act goofy and stupid, act like a clown or something. No, you stand for the truth and people will look at you as a fool. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Would you be willing to have people make fun of you? That's another one of the sacrifices. Now it gets really tough. You say, I thought it was tough already. No, <laughs> Now we hit the two big ones. Would you be willing to sacrifice your health? I mean, would you be willing to do things that for the Lord, serve the Lord and everything? I'm going to tell you right now, if you do a lot of study for the Lord, I'm talking a lot of study, you're going to get headaches. Your eyesight is going to start getting bad. Okay, that's the kind of stuff that happened to Paul. You're not always going to have the best food. You're not always going to get the best exercise. Would you be willing to sacrifice your health for the Lord? That's a big one. And finally, the biggest of all, would you sacrifice your life for the Lord? Are you willing to die in the cause of Jesus Christ? I say, well, that, that really isn't happening yet. Yeah, that's true. In most of the English-speaking world, we still have the freedom to be able to preach the gospel without going to prison and being tortured. But there are many places here in this world where Christians are being killed for their faith. Would you be willing to give up your life? If they passed a law in your country and said, anybody who's a professing Christian that holds to this King James Bible and that Jesus is the only way to heaven 
Anybody that does that is going to be instantly executed. We're going to send troops around to each house and they're going to say, do you confess that Jesus Christ is the only way and do you confess that the King James Bible is the only Bible and whatever else they might put in? And if you say yes, they'll take you out back and shoot you in the head. Would you be willing to die for Jesus Christ? You say, well, that, that sounds like a sacrifice to me. Yeah, it is. And that's something that the Lord's going to get you to that point where he says, you're, need, you're going to need to present your body a living sacrifice. You say, well, boy, I don't know if I could give all that stuff up. Well, here's the thing. If you say no to those, if you say, no, I don't think I could give up my family. I don't think I could give up my friends or my career or my dreams and goals or especially my health and life. God's not going to be able to totally use you. Okay, God, you'll still be saved, whatever, but God can't really reveal his perfect will for your life until you're willing to make your body, present your body as a living sacrifice. But if you say yes to those things, you need to remember that Abraham obeyed God by placing his son, Isaac, on the altar. But God did not make him sacrifice his son. See, God is not forcing you. He's not going to say, if you say to me that I'm going to, you know, that you'll give up your life for me, I'm going to send guys tomorrow to kill you. No, that might not happen. Okay? God just wants you to be putting it on the altar and saying, if it needs to happen, Lord, yeah, I'm ready. I'll make those sacrifices. God wants to see that you're willing to take that step of faith. Okay? Are you going to have to separate from friends, from family, from other Christians? Are you going to have to spend some time alone as a Christian with biblical separation? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, just let me say this and answer here, the final thing I want to say on the thing of biblical separation, and that is the Lord might have somebody that lives a mile down the road from you that you've never met or within 10 miles of where you live that you don't even know and they're going through the exact same thing that you are and the Lord might say well I want you to grow and I want this other person to grow and at the right time I'm going to cross your paths and I'm going to bring you two together but you're not ready yet see the Lord will direct your path okay he isn't going to straighten it like the new versions twist the scripture there in Proverbs and, and say he'll direct it all right, and you have to let him do that. You have to be willing to submit to the Lord. And if you see something that's that's definitely wrong, you have somebody that you are associating with and they're definitely wrong, well, I would say first thing that you need to do is just start speaking the truth to them. And if it offends them, well, that usually is going to drive them off. <laughs> the truth is very offensive. And if, you might have to get to a point with a friend or or whatever where you say, I'm sorry, I, I can't be around you. If you're going to continue going to that modern wicked church and you're going to continue believing these heretical things, I'm sorry, I can't have anything to do with you. You know, I, I there was a guy at a church the one time that uh, I had some very big doctrinal disputes with him and I left that church and he called up the one time and he said, I really miss you. And I was tempted at first it came into my mind i was going to say you know yeah i miss you too and i thought you know that that would be a lie i don't miss him he's the reason i left so i just i didn't answer <laughs> you know I, I didn't say anything he said well boy that was rude yeah but you know what he never called again okay problem solved i separated from a man that was messed up doctrinally now if i ever see him out in public i'm not going to ignore him but if I see him, I'm going to have to admonish him as a brother. I'm going to have to correct him or say something about where he's wrong, doctrinally. So should you separate from professing Christians? Yes. Okay, now finally, the last question here is Christians and TV. In these last days, I find it almost impossible to turn the TV on without being bombarded by absolute immoral evil filth. Amen. I can agree totally to that. 
uh, it is just getting worse and worse. I have a teenage daughter, so I am a, in a double bind of how to keep this stuff out of our home without seeming like a total zealot and repelling her from Christianity. I would just be interested to hear a talk given on whether the point has come where TV is unable to be re- viewed now in these last days without being assaulted with the barrage of ungodliness and antichrist rhetoric. I personally would love to throw my TV set out, but how does an a believer deal with the issue when other family members cannot imagine a life without one? Is this something we should take a stand on, considering the evil stuff constantly being broadcast on TV, even down to the adverts, you know, advertisements? Uh, then the, the listener here says, anyways, just some ideas. May the Lord bless your fellowship of believers. Well, thank you, and may the Lord bless you too for these good questions. Uh, Christians and television. Oh boy, here's a big one. I've been wanting to do a message on this particular subject for a while. I'm going to address a couple verses here and a couple things I want to say, but this is a big subject. Uh, this is actually a very easy thing to answer, but it's going to be hard for a lot of people to accept. Okay, should a Christian watch television? First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, let me ask a very simple question. Can you watch TV without seeing evil? No. But you say, it's not real evil. It's just pretend. They're just acting. Uh, that's why the verse says, abstain from all appearance of evil. It doesn't say all evil. It says appearance of evil. You see, a lot of people, you know, back before television was created, they wouldn't have known half of about of the evil things that people have seen and witnessed through television and movies. They wouldn't have even known about it a century ago. But today, you can have all kinds of evil, wicked things put into your mind through television. You know, and it, the the whole thing is you cannot totally get away from it. I'm going to talk more about that as as we continue. Psalm 101 verse 3 says. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Does TV cleave to you? Yes. If you see something evil and wicked in your mind, I bet you if I said to you, close your eyes right now and think of the last evil thing that you saw on television, I bet you can still see it in your mind. You can still recite probably exactly what was said, exactly what was done. Why? It's cleaving to you. Okay, there's... Television is not just some neutral thing that maybe, you know, it's okay and maybe not. It's evil. It's very evil. Uh, Interesting thing here in Numbers chapter 33, verses 51 and 52, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from, from before you and destroy all their pictures and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. You know that when TV and movies first came out, they were called picture shows? And that's all they are, really. It's a lot of pictures that are sped up very quickly. That's what they are. They're pictures. What's a picture do? It puts images into your mind. Hmm. Now, what's the main purpose of television? What's the main purpose of it? Well, 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Television presents a world of celebrities who are fornicating, drunken, drug-addicted psychopaths. Really. I mean, seriously, they are. You know, they're always getting in trouble and they're, you know, having to haul them off on stretchers and stuff strapped down. They're, you know, almost foaming at the mouth, chewing on their tongue, kind of, you know. And, and people watch that stuff. And this, this woman's running around now with this woman and this, this movie star just divorced his wife and then he, he's going to run out with this girl and have a Why would you watch that filth? Why would you be interested in the lives and the celebrity gossip and everything? Is the Lord pleased with that? I don't think so. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 and 11 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 
But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. So what is television really about? Television is about selling you things that you don't need. That's what television is. You know, and it's interesting because if you go back into the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, right around there when people were really starting to get televisions into their homes, they were, the mind control was not nearly as sophisticated back then. And they would say about, you know, this program brought to you by, uh, General Mills cereals, or, or back then it was cigarettes too, you know, Winston cigarettes, you know, you'd see that stuff. What our, what television is, it's designed to sell you things. And at first it was, you know, we'll sell you cigarettes or we'll sell you this type of cereal or it's sponsored by this soda manufacturer or this or the Chevy or Ford or Dodge or whoever. But now it's gotten a lot darker. Now it goes far beyond just selling you consumerism and products. It's now starting to sell you the darker side. And I want to talk just for a minute about the darker side of modern day television. Okay. And this is one I want to, I got to really put this thing into video form for you to really see how bad the level of mind control is. Uh, today it, it is scientific mind manipulation. Okay. There are so many things that you could get into here. The, the thing of, um, the digital television thing that they can transmit through and it's very close to your brain frequency. And I mean, it's, it's some bad stuff, but even just things like they have flashing lights. Now, if you walk, turn your TV on sometime and walk and, and have no lights on in the room and then walk to the side of the television and look over and you'll see that the room is just lighting up just like with flashes of light. And now there's a lot to that as well as far as different programs, you know, program. What's your favorite, favorite TV program? Get it? You're being programmed. Different programs will have different flashes of light. Sporting events and things that are meant to be aggressive, movies and things, they'll boom, 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 boom. They'll flash really, really fast. You can see that. A lot of other programs like news media and things where they want you to be passive, they'll do slower pulsating flashes. This stuff is real. Revolving circles. Start looking for revolving circles in the backgrounds of especially news casts. You'll see that there's revolving circles. What's that? It's hypnotism. And it's interesting. I did some in-depth study on that, and they said that one of the ways that a hypnotist can know that he has successfully hypnotized his subject is if they have a blank stare and their lower jaw drops and their mouth hangs open and they just sit there and stare. Now you look at somebody who's really into watching television, they're hypnotized. Okay, something else. What about red and blue collars? Look at most news media and the background and the surrounding areas and things, it'll be red and blue. And it oftentimes the light will be pulsating on and off, on and off. Red and blue lights. What do police have? Red and blue. Why? Because red is aggressive, blue is passive. So you have red and blue lights flashing. It creates confusion in the mind on a subconscious level. It can, it, it kind of creates like, what do I do? What do I do? Do I run? Do I, do I just sit here and take it? Or, you know, it creates confusion, bewildering the person. I mean, study this stuff. It's not, it's not some kind of conspiracy theory. I mean, get on uh, collar websites and things where they talk about different types of collars and things to paint your room. And they'll say red is a, is an aggressive collar. Blue is a passive collar. Uh, what about attractive news anchors? You get these supermodel women telling you what the news is, telling you how the stock market did today or something. What's that all about? And they'll put lipstick on that makes their lips look wet. Hmm. Very interesting. What about music? Music is a great mind control tool. You play the right kind of music in the background, you can evoke strong emotions. 
I'll tell you what, it is it is bad. Now they have a, a thing here too in the modern television, swishing sounds. Okay, it'll it'll go to the news and it'll say, uh, joining us now in the newsroom, we have Ben Smith over here at the thing. It'll go and it'll and the screen will will switch and it'll go or something like that. It doesn't even make sense, you know. And and you'll see it in sporting events. So. They have these weird sounds, these swishing sounds. You don't even realize how many levels of, of mind control are in the TV programming. And I have a video. Uh, it was it was a you know mainstream media news coverage type of a thing where the Pentagon here in America actually admitted that they have an office of propaganda that works specifically with Hollywood. Hollywood is not allowed to put out movies that don't first pass through the Ministry of Propaganda. And they have members of the CIA and, and things and, and high-level ranking military officials going out and meeting with Hollywood producers and telling them what to produce. And notice, too, that Hollywood is putting out more and more films about collapsed societies and people having to join together and everything. All this end times type of a stuff. Very interesting. Okay. And most television viewers are addicted. Because of the high levels of mind control that are now coming through television. I'm telling you what, I'm scared to death of television. If it's on, I'm hiding my eyes, I'm getting out of that room, I don't want anything to do with it. And the strange thing is, there are elites, very wealthy type people, and they stay away from television too. They know that it's very powerful mind control. I know somebody uh, here locally, they are very, very wealthy Uh some people that I know, and they have children that go to an extremely exclusive private school. And in that private school, they teach the kids, do not watch television. They teach them that at this elite private school. Why? They know what television is. Bad stuff. Uh, and again, as a Christian, you're probably going to find yourself alone on this issue. The listener that wrote the email, they're having that problem. They're alone on this issue in their home. Now, if you are the man of the house, you're the head of the home, then you can tell your wife and children that TV is now far too wicked and ungodly and that you won't have it in your home anymore. All right? Uh, and you're going to need to do something to replace that addiction. Okay, it's not going to be just something where you shut it off and, and it's all over. You know, that's going to be tough. Encourage your children to read books. And if, you know, you want to have some kind of entertainment, uh, you know, you can play board games or things like that. Or you could even get DVDs. Go get some good Christian DVDs and, and have, you know, you could still keep your television and, and things, but disconnect any kind of antennas or any kind of way that it could be used to, you know, plug into the mainstream media. Just stay away from that stuff. You know, but get some good, wholesome DVDs. And then you can watch those if you have to be entertained. But if you are a wife and your husband is not willing to give up the television, well, then you're going to have a little bit more difficult time. You're going to have to pray for him and make it clear that you are against the television and stay out of the room when it's on. And you're going to have a struggle. I'm going to tell you that. And there again, I know of situations where you know, the husband is just dead set. He's going to watch the television and he can't be talked out of it. You got to pray for him. Uh, and like I said, Lord willing, at some point in the future, you know, there's only, I'm the only one really working right now in this ministry. Uh, but at some point in the future, I would like to make a video on television and mind control because it is a huge subject. It's not just the sin anymore. That's something that you need to understand. It's no longer just the wickedness and perversion. It's actual mind control. It's mind manipulation. It is, there are so many levels to it. Just, it's so deep. It goes so, it's so complicated. It is scary to think of how that thing is manipulating the minds of people. And as a Christian, you can't say, well, God will protect me. He won't let me be deceived in these things. No, you better watch that. 
Okay, you need to be real careful of that. Now I want to uh, conclude here with one more verse of scripture, and then we're going to end this study. First uh, Thessalonians chapter five verse twenty three says, "And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body." Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I can say a big amen to that. There are many things down here that you are just going to have to do yourself. The Lord's not going to fight all your battles for you. He's not going to do everything for you. He's, you know, He will be there to guide you, to help you, lead you into the truth. But the Lord expects you to do some things on your own. And you need to pray about the thing of insurance. You need to, to see what the Lord would have you do that on that. Separation, you must be separate from the lost world. And if you're around professing Christians and they're very wicked and they live apostate from the Lord, apostate from the things written in Scripture, then you need to pray about it. And if you need to separate from them, separate from them. And if you have to spend a little bit of time alone with the Lord and get to know the Lord on a much more intimate level, just you and Him. Not a big church, not, you know, a big group of people, you know, which a lot of times these big churches are just social gatherings. They're just clubs is all they are. And people want that. They want to have that. They don't want to deal with the Lord on a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one basis. They want that group think so they can conform to the group so they can kind of justify their sins, you know. They can kind of say, well, everybody else is doing it at church, so I guess it's okay. no. You're going to have to separate yourself and draw nearer to God. And at some point in time, the Lord will cross your path with somebody else. The Lord might have you be separated so that you can study and learn and draw close to Him so that He can use you in the future to lead other people into the truth. That's a very important thing. If I had had a good church all these years and been married and wife and kids and been part of a good fellowship and all that, I wouldn't be where I am today. It took me having to depart from the churches and going and looking for the answers myself and dealing with the Lord, just me and Him. It took me years of study to get to where I am now in ministry. And I'm thankful for it. It was rough going through it, you know, very rough. But I'm glad now that I'm at the other end of it, the opposite end of it. You know, now the Lord can use me because I've gone through that solitary confinement thing. I mean, think of it this way. You can always fall back to solitary confinement. If you get around people and they're all compromising and everything, you just say, well, I've been alone before. I'll do it again. <laughs> but if you're used to being around a big group of people, it's going to be rough for you. Okay, don't conform to the world. And also be willing to present your body as a living sacrifice. And finally, television... I'd stay away from it. The Lord's not going to be able to do much with you if you're filling your mind and all these wicked things are cleaving to you and you're being put under a constant, continuous system of mind control. The Lord's not going to be able to do much with you. So that's going to be it for this study. There's a lot to cover and a very enjoyable three questions. I had a good time putting this thing together. So I pray that you've learned something. And... uh Please, if you have any suggestions for future sermons, anybody out there, just let me know. So that's it for now. Thank you so much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.